Today, I'm going to explain episode 3 and 4 of a Brazilian dystopian thriller series called 3%. Spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. After the third round, all the participants are called to the cafeteria. They use the coins they won to get themselves drinks of their choice. Since they have lived in poverty all their lives, the drinks are a luxury to them. Everyone enjoys the privilege except Joanna, who keeps staring at the coin. Before coming to the program, she used to be an orphan on the streets. She stole and robbed people for a living. One day, she was caught by a group of men whose money she stole. They beat her up and took all of her savings. Joanna still remembers the day clearly and holds the coin closer instead of spending it. Meanwhile, Ezekiel is tense because of increasing pressure from Aline. A trusted council member named Nair asks him to be careful. She knows that one of the council members sent Aline to remove Ezekiel from the post. Outside, the participants are called for the next task. This one is also a group task, where they will have to collectively walk down a dark tunnel in five minutes. Raphael thinks it's too easy to be true. His suspicion is proven valid when they realize the tunnel is filled with a gas that messes with their heads. It makes them think of the things they regret doing and triggers their biggest fear. Michelle cannot stop thinking about how she killed Berna for her own benefit. Fernando is scared that he is about to fail. Something whispers Raphael to give up because he is a cheater, all because of the gas. Joanna is the most bothered by it, which means she has done something she dreadfully regrets. When things look bad for the group, she snaps out of the imaginary world and runs down the tunnel. However, in the end, she is told that everyone in the group has to make it for her to win. Meanwhile, Ezekiel and Aline are analyzing the participants. Ezekiel claims that the task is to make sure the contestants are emotionally strong enough to make it offshore. Joanna returns to the rest of the group and drags them forward. One of the girls named Cassia is afraid that she is going to die during the process. She goes into a frenzy and refuses to listen. As the last resort, Joanna drags the girl by her legs. They get to the end seconds before the timer goes off and pass the test. The operator informs them that the effect of the gas might last for a bit longer. Following that, the participants are sent to the dorm room to rest for the night. Everyone is fine except Cassia, who is still trembling because of the gas. Michelle and Fernando come outside to spend time in peace. Fernando asks her about her brother because she mentioned him inside the tunnel. To avoid the topic, she kisses him. At night, Joanna dreams about the day she made the biggest mistake of her life. She wanted to get her money back from the thugs who took it. Therefore, she snuck into their house when no one was around. She got her money and was about to leave when a noise made her fire in a random direction as a reflex. It turns out that she shot the son of the leader of the gang. She regrets that day more than anything in life. She knew the gang wouldn't let her live and her only way to escape was to go offshore. But she hadn't registered yet and the process started the next day. At last, she went to a con artist to have a false chip embedded behind her ears and came to the process the next day. Even her name, Joanna, is fake. Back in the dorm, she sees someone walking outside and follows them to the bathroom. She cannot stop thinking about the child she killed and imagines him inside one of the stalls. Suddenly, she is attacked by Cassia, who is still under the influence of the gas. The girl is about to kill Joanna before Raphael stops her. He makes sure to get Cassia to bed before returning to Joanna. As they talk, he notices the cup behind her ear and finds out she also has a fake registration. He thanks her for what she did in the tunnel before returning to his bed. Outside, Ezekiel notices someone sneaking into the headquarters. He runs to get the person who turns out to be a little kid named Augusto. He quickly brings him inside and deletes the CCTV footage. The kid reveals he is hungry and Ezekiel brings dinner for the both of them. It's not revealed what the relationship between the two is, but Ezekiel seems to love and care for Augusto. All of a sudden, Aline knocks on the door. Ezekiel quickly hides the kid behind a wall and lets her in. She sees the plates and asks him if he has company, but Ezekiel smartly dodges the question. He knows that someone from the council sent her to keep an eye on him, but Aline denies being involved in anything like that. She asks him to relax before making her way out. Ezekiel finally sighs of relief and brings Augusto out of hiding. The two make their way outside where they share a final hug before separating. In the dorm, Michelle and Fernando talk about how their life will be offshore. 
they have started to fall for each other, which is a disadvantage for Michelle since she has come for a singular purpose. In another bed, Joanna thanks Raphael for saving her life earlier. The next morning, Joanna is the first one to wake up. She comes outside to see that the entryway from yesterday has been sealed. The others wake up and register that she is telling the truth. Joanna finds a vent and yells into it asking for help, but gets no reply. Marco gets more anxious by the second, thinking that they are being tested. He tries forcefully opening the doors, but it gets him nowhere. In the room, he notices there are several levers. There is also a strange monitor that shows a series of binary digits in the hallway. Marco stares at it for a long time, thinking about his past. He was raised by his family caretaker and has never met his father who passed the process before Marco was born. Everyone from his family has made it offshore, which makes him believe it is the only reason he's alive. Before leaving, he gave his pregnant wife a letter to give to his child. Now that he stands in front of the mirror, he remembers his motto, which helps him think of an idea. He calls everyone to the corridor after breaking the code to get out. Outside, Ezekiel and the agents are watching everything through the CCTV camera. They admire Marco for his quick thinking, because while others were hanging around doing nothing, he actually put in work to figure out the task. Marco reveals that the binary numbers in the monitor correlate to the lever in their rooms. If they arrange the levers according to the numbers on a screen, they have a chance to open the door. Ezekiel and his team are surprised that Marco was able to figure this out so quickly. He separates the participants into the ones who memorize the numbers and the ones who pull the lever. Since the number changes every few rounds, he stays in the corridor to keep an eye on the monitor. The first team remembers the numbers and rushes to the rooms to tell the others. The second team pulls the lever according to their instructions. The plan works, but instead of the doors opening, they get a single packet of food from a vent. The participants argue about who gets to eat the first packet. Marco insists it must be him because he came up with the idea, but the others disagree. So instead, they settle on distributing the meals alphabetically. After the first girl eats her share, they continue working for the others. Soon, they receive packets of meals one after another. The agents declare that they win because everyone is a team worker and no conflicts have risen yet. However, Ezekiel is not satisfied. He insists they lengthen the task and change the rules a bit. All of a sudden, the participants stop receiving the food even after trying several times. They realize the rules of the task have changed but do not know what to do next. Suddenly, the vent makes a loud noise. On checking, a large batch of food drops to the floor. Everyone happily picks up as many as they want but Michelle stops them. She makes them understand that rationing the food out would be the best option because they might be stuck for a while. Everyone agrees and picks up only three packets each. Marco is not happy to be replaced as the leader, even though no one officially declared him one. He convinces Raphael to be on his side, declaring that they have to find a way to exit as soon as possible. Raphael believes him since the management wouldn't have sent so much food if they didn't want them to stay in the dorms for longer. They find a door that can potentially be opened and gather up bulky guys for the task. In the meantime, Aline breaks into Ezekiel's office and tries opening his computer. This alerts him and his agents and they catch her red-handed. Furious at the intrusion, Ezekiel sets a virtual meeting with the members of the council and blames a man named Matthias for trying to sabotage his position. Matthias is the one who wants Ezekiel out of the process and has sent Aline for the same purpose, but he refuses to take accountability for his actions. Ezekiel abruptly ends the meeting when Matthias refuses his involvement. Back in the dorm, Marco and the group open the door forcefully but end up in another closed room. Because of all the work, they are hungry. Marco declares himself the alpha and goes around demanding food from the others because he is doing the most work. When a guy refuses to give him his portion, Marco almost chokes him to death. Raphael doesn't like the idea and apologizes to everyone whose food was taken. He asks Marco to stop the brutality, but the guy declares that he will have to keep others in check to win the task. He continues terrorizing the others, planning to take all the food for his group. Ezekiel smiles, satisfied at his decision to lengthen the task. He knew that their animalistic instincts only come out when they face a life or death situation with no guarantee of the future. Somewhere else, Aline is on a call with Matthias. He belittles her for not being careful, but she insists she is very close to revealing Ezekiel's secret. After the call, she brings out the fingerprint that she found in Ezekiel's office, which she is sure doesn't belong to him. She wants to study the print and find out who else was in the room. Meanwhile, the dorm goes into a frenzy as Marco grows more aggressive. 
Joanna knows that she won't survive if she stays in there longer. Hence, she makes her way up the vent even though it's almost impossible to climb it. When she finally makes it to the end somehow, she finds Ezekiel standing on top. Ezekiel shows Joanna the CCTV footage and explains the meaning behind the task. He wants the contestants to know the unfair nature of the world. Back in the dorm, Michelle and her group barricades the room to prevent Marco's group from entering. Marco finds a girl hiding her share of food under her clothes and takes it away. He also orders her to apologize, which she reluctantly does. Still, he hits her with a metal rod that ends her life. Raphael tries to help the girl, but is shocked to find out she is not breathing. He loses patience and attacks Marco, only to be pulled away by his group. Raphael runs towards the safe zone to seek help from Michelle. He begs her to let him in, but Michelle doesn't trust him enough to do so. But then, he whispers something into her ears which makes her open the door immediately. The gang arrives seconds later and starts trying to break the barricade. Outside, Ezekiel tells Joanna that the only person who can stop the test is her. If she agrees to go down and change the course of action, the gates will open. She takes on the challenge and goes back inside through the vent. Marco's group has kept everyone hostage in a single room with a guy guarding them. She attacks the guy, letting the others go rampant. They soon attack Marco's group and beat them up brutally. When they finally stop, the doors to the dorm open, leading them to a forest outside. The dorm is filled with dead bodies lying all around. A severely injured Marco tries to make it outside before the door closes. He makes it to the end, but is killed after being sliced by the door. Outside, Fernando asks Michelle what Raphael said to her earlier. She dismisses the conversation, claiming she just trusted him out of instinct. Then, a flashback shows us one day before the process started. Raphael was drinking with his friend who had just turned 20 and was registered to play this year. Raphael had lost last year and was eager for a second chance, so he knocked his friend out and stole his registration device. Raphael's actual name is Tiago, and his friend whose identity he stole was named Raphael. But the most shocking part is revealed when we see Raphael going to a lady who is a member of the cause. This means he is also part of the rebellious organization that is working against the process. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notification, and leave a like to help the channel out.